hey, you think your preacher's boring? Paul literally preached through the night and somebody fell asleep and died because of his preaching, but he raised him from the dead. Come on, let's check it out together. Hey, welcome to Bible Time, everybody. Thanks for joining me today. This is the place that we read the Bible together. If you're new to the channel, just know that this is not a sermon or a lecture. The purpose of this is not for me to teach you. The purpose is for all of us to read the Bible together, and I'll share my thoughts along the way. But the power is in the Word of God, and the real power is in through uh, in us listening to the Holy Spirit. So I want to encourage you to spend some time in prayer, uh, either right now, hit pause, or at the end of this, in reflection to what the Word is saying. Because as we learn from the, the written Word, we want to listen to the spoken Word, and we want to put it into practice. And so... I just hope and pray that through this that you are growing in your love and affection for God in real relationship and your obedience to him. So we are going to jump in to Acts chapter, what chapter are we in? I think we're in 19. Acts 19 verse 21. And this is what it says. Now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia, and go to Jerusalem. Side note, I just wonder what this means, resolved in the Spirit. Because it doesn't say His Spirit, which in in the Greek it would have, uh, Spirit would have been specifically referred to as Him, but it doesn't say that. Like, you'd be able to tell in the Greek. And so, the Spirit makes me think that you know, it's talking about the Holy Spirit, of course. And so what does that mean that he resolved in the Spirit? Like through prayer, he just knew like, okay, this is what the confirmation is. I wish I knew. That's a that's a question for me. But anyway, here we go. Saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent to Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, He himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way, those that followed Jesus. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines to Artemis, brought no little business in to the craftsmen. So, Artemis was the Ephesian goddess... There was a massive temple in Ephesus. I think it was one of the seven wonders of the world. But at the time, Ephesus would have been considered one of the one of the greatest cities. And there was a huge temple to the goddess Artemis. And the thing about Artemis is not only was she a false god, but uh, I believe that she was like a sex god. And so one of the ways that they would worship her is through sexual immorality and things like this. And so... There's all these people in the city that would make statues of this god um, and sell them, and it was good business for them. So this is the scene that we're entering into and what's going on in Ephesus as Paul's uh, doing his work. So it says this, These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that this business that we You know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that the gods made with hands are not gods. Interesting. I guess it does take a genius to figure that out, but that's what they believed. Many, many religions believe that they can make little shrines or little statues or little whatevers of their God and that somehow that thing would be real, which is such a unique thought. And it's uh, spoken against many times in the scriptures. And so, plus just rationality tells us that if I make it with my hands, it's probably not God. But anyway, and there's a danger not only... uh, that this trade of ours may come to disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. 
So it's uh, quite the compliment that, that Paul's getting here, that his his ministry and his work and his preaching is, uh, you know, they're concerned that it's going to lead to the, the tearing down of their entire religion and that the belief in their God Artemis is going to fall and crumble simply based on his ministry. And so I consider that to be a pretty, pretty big uh, compliment. But anyway, let's see what happens. When they heard this, they were enraged and crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and some dude with a weird name, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. Um, now, I just think that it's cool to note that this theater in Ephesus, uh, back in the day, it held 25 thousand people um i did look that up once and because i wanted to see like what what this situation was looking like um and if if my memory serves me correctly pretty massive theater for for back in the day outdoor theater like amphitheater type situation um and so anyway there's a lot going on and everybody's all kind of going crazy there's chaos going on he they drag uh paul's companions in and then let's see what happens verse 30 but when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. I just think this is amazing. Paul wished to go in among the crowd. So you've got upwards of 25,000 people, thousands of people uh, going crazy. A lot of them upset because it seems like they're going to either lose their business and lose their money or those that are actually real believers in this God are concerned that, you know, this guy's preaching heresy against the religion, going to tear down the religion. And they're in this theater, and they're in chaos, and Paul wants to go in there, but his disciples wouldn't let him. And even some of the mm -hmm, Asiarchs, no idea what those are. Don't know what that is, but who are friends of his sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now, some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, but Alexander, motioning with his hands, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Two hours. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know what the city of the Ephesians is? Excuse me. Men of Ephesus. Who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? See, I don't I wonder what that is. Some stone that fell from the sky that made them think that they were something special. I don't know. Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. I love that. He's pointing out that what they're doing in preaching Jesus, they're not intentionally going out of their way to slander Artemis. They're not being blasphemous towards Artemis. They're not, they're not speaking against uh, the Ephesian religion at all, which I think is beautiful because, again, it's just another... Um, something that we can learn in terms of how they went about sharing their message and their belief. That they didn't go out of their way to tear other people down. They didn't go out of their way to, you know, say, this is why your religion is wrong and all these things. They were preaching Jesus and it was changing people's lives and it was starting to freak, freak people out. So, if therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open. And there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. 
for we, for we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So, uh, such fruitful ministry going on in Ephesus, this great and mighty city. That there was this riot and everything going on, but finally this guy convinced them, hey, they're not even speaking against our religion, so we shouldn't do anything. Unless there's an actual charge, then take them to court. And so they moved on. So, good stuff. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed from Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews, he was set sail for Syria. He decided to return, return through Macedonia. Sopater, the Berean, son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him, and the Thessalonians, some dude's name, and some dude's name, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, and the Asians, and Tychicus, and man, a lot of weird names in here. Anyway, all these people. Verse 5. And they went ahead and they were waiting for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. And in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. So, little section, bunch of names, bunch of descriptions about where they went. And uh, let's move on. Verse 7, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. <laughs> this passage is so funny. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and, the, and a young man named Eutychus was sitting in the window, and he sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer, and being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. So, hey, if you think that your preacher at your church is boring, uh, look at this one. Paul talked through the night, past midnight, and this dude fell down dead. <laughs> that is hilarious. But Paul went down and bent over him. And taking him into his arms, said, Do not be alarmed, his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak, and so departed. And they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. They were really comforted. <laughs> so Paul's preaching makes this dude fall out of the third story window. He dies. Paul goes down there and raises him from the dead. And... Keeps talking to him, and then he goes on his way. Craziness. But going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Asos, intending to take Paul ab aboard there, for so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us in Asos, we took him on board and went to some place. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite Chios, and the next day we touched Samos, and the day after that we went to Miletus, for Paul decided to sail past Ephesus, so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be in Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. So, this is an interesting passage, because... It's a lot of, like, names. It's a lot of, this is where we went. It's a little bit of, this was what happened. And so, here we are, out of time for, for the day. And we've got this passage that, you know, I guess maybe at first look, you could feel like, ah, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't know, I didn't get much out of that today. And so, I want to stop there because I want to, I want to intentionally point out that, you know, not every day that you read something, um, you know, sometimes you only have 15 minutes, sometimes you have more, and, and I think we should keep going if you have more time and you're able, but sometimes it's just 15 minutes and it's like, 
you know, it, it just kind of washes over you or, you know, you feel like, man, I don't know, there's, what is there in there? And, uh, and, I, and I always want to encourage, especially through these videos, part of the purpose of these videos is just to show you that not everybody has like this banquet dinner of a time. Just because you're a pastor or a preacher doesn't mean that like every time you open the Bible, it's just like the coolest stuff in the world. Um, you know, I say this often, but it's just like eating. Um, I don't remember what I had to eat last week, most of the meals, but they sustained me. They kept me going. They kept me healthy. And it's like the word of God to just eat every day, even if you don't remember it, even if it's not like this, you know, mind blowing steak dinner at the top of the space needle. Um, you're going to have those occasionally like that amazing dinner that you remember. And sometimes that happens. But most of the time, it's just daily sustenance, uh, training from the word. And so, um, you know, what, I, what I'm doing here today is I want to look at just this and say, man, is there anything that I can be encouraged by? And uh, I can think of just a few things, even though it's not like the greatest passage in the world. Some of the things that I'm encouraged by is the fact that um, their evangelism was spread through a positivity message, not not tearing down something else, but lifting up Jesus. It was causing great effect. Many people were coming to know the Lord and they were so concerned that he was going to convert all of Asia and that their religion was going to crumble. Um, I'm encouraged that Paul was full of courage. He wanted to go into the theater to talk to these people. He probably was thinking not, oh no, are these thousands of people going to kill me? He probably was thinking, hey, this is an audience that I have that's ready to listen to me and it's more people than less. So that's good. Um, I, I'm encouraged. I can I can find a, a lesson in all these names, that there's all these people that are working together, that this is a team thing in what they're doing. Um, I can find encouragement as a preacher that, hey, even Paul made somebody fall asleep and die because of his sermon. So, I mean, so many things. Um, I just want to encourage you to spend just a moment in prayer and just say, you know, Lord, is there anything from this passage or just anything from your heart that you want to say to me today? That, that I might put it into practice and walk it out today. I want to follow you. And so that's my encouragement to you. So we'll see you again tomorrow. God bless.